Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> uh, today, um, is everybody here for the Asian cooking class? No. <laughs> um, so, Reset Cities workshop number four. Four. Um, so, December eighth, um, we are very excited to be here again in our series that we do once a month to help provide education and technical assistance to cities with regards to the best practices of the Reset Cities program. Um, I'm Diana McEwen. I um, direct the metro region of CERT, Clean Energy Resource Teams. We're one of the um, partners um, for the Reset Cities program, and I'm based at the Great Plains Institute. Um, so I'm just going to kind of introduce the MC, um, and then I'll step aside and I'll come back at the end, but I do want to just say a couple of things. Um, we do record all of these, so if you miss some of the past ones, they're, they're recorded and you can find those. Um, we send out a link at the end of each webinar with the link to all the resources, etc. Um, I want to thank our series sponsor, Excel Energy, um, has been a series sponsor for the, all the workshops, so thank you to them. And um, for today, our uh, co-sponsor co for today is MinTap, and I really want to thank MinTap for um, participating and sponsoring the workshops so we can provide this um, service and we're very excited. We have a lot of people out there on the webinar. Um, this was something that we tested last year and really added this year and it's really given an opportunity for cities in greater Minnesota, or even the greater areas of met the metro region to be able to participate without coming into town. Although we'd love to see your face in the room. So um, I think that's all. Is, that, is there anything else that I need to share? Um, just the host partners yes. are. Oh, the host partners. So each, there's a Green Set Cities is a partnership, and so the host partners are the Dep Department of Commerce, Division of Energy Resources, and our colleagues that are in the room. Um, <laughs> well, I'm going to take a picture of that later, Pete, and um, tweet that. Um, Minnesota and the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and um, Philip and Bill Dunn are here in the room as well. Um, so thanks to everyone, and again, for MINTAP for co-sponsoring the workshop. Um, we are here in St. Paul at the League of Minnesota Cities, one of our uh, partners. Um, they offer the space for us to do the workshops. We really appreciate that. And um, then I think I get to introduce the MC, who is, happens to be a former coworker of mine um, at the Great Plains Institute, Adam Sowett. Adam, Great. with the Department of Commerce Division of Energy Research. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. Yeah, thanks. So today's workshop. Uh, we're going to be is focused on improving energy efficiency and uh, harnessing renewable energy opportunities at Minnesota's wastewater treatment facilities. Um, this effort is funded through a U.S. Department of Energy grant. Uh, it really focuses on uh, helping facilities lower their operating costs uh, through improved energy efficiency and providing up-to-date resources and information that help inform uh, the decision-making of facilities and city staff. So I'd like to thank uh, everybody for attending today's uh, presentation. I'm really excited to be here and uh, be able to present to you today. Uh, I'd like to thank Diana and uh, Patrick and Philip and all the Great Step City staff for hosting this workshop and uh, letting us speak today. And uh, thank a special thanks to Lindsay Wimmer for uh, coordinating our team and uh, helping us get all the logistics uh, set for today's workshop and, uh, and the U.S. Department of Energy for funding our project and letting us undertake this, uh, this effort. So, thank you. Um, so, my name is Adam Sowett. I'm the uh, project manager for this grant. I have four of our key team members here today who are uh, working on the grant and will be presenting on a variety of topics. Um, so, they'll each be presenting 15 minutes each. Uh, followed by a five-minute Q&A after each presentation, and then a 15-minute Q&A at the end of the session. So with that, I'll uh, introduce our first uh, speaker. Um, Jessica Burdett is the Conservation Improvement Program Supervisor at the Minnesota Department of Commerce and oversees the regulation of over 180 natural gas and electric utility demand side management programs to ensure achievement of the 1.5% energy resource standard. Uh, her presentation today will focus on the value of EE and RE uh, for wastewater treatment plants for cities and will provide an overview of the main objectives of the DOE uh, project. So with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Jessica. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Good morning. Let me grab my clicker real quick. All right. Well. Um, uh, I just realized the other day that we are almost a year into this project. 
project, and I keep talking about it as if it just started. So I'm really glad to <coughs> give an update on where we are, as well as an overview of the value of energy efficiency and renewable energy in the wastewater treatment sector. Um, this is a, a pretty... Uh, um, so this is a, a, a project that has a lot of applicability to uh, cities and municipals here in Minnesota, and we've assembled a really great team to deliver the as different aspects of the project, um, a few of which today are going to talk about the, myself, talking about the value of efficiency and renewable energy. Laura Babcock, who's the uh, MNCAP director, is going to talk a little bit more in depth about the project uh, and MNCAP's experience working in the wastewater treatment sector. Bill Dunn with the PCA, um, uh, who's a partner on this project, the Pollution Control Agency, is going to talk a little bit more about benchmarking and financing in the wastewater treatment sector. And AJ Vandenberg, who is a engineer with MNCAP, is going to talk about um, the different requirements of project participation and, and how to get started and how to participate. So just to give you slide, um, just to give you a few facts uh, around what energy efficiency uh, or what uh, wastewater the wastewater treatment sector uses in uh, the United States, it's about three percent of the nation's total energy consumption, <coughs> which equates to about four billion dollars annually um, in energy costs around drinking water and wastewater utilities. Um, this is the equivalent of about 56 billion kilowatt hours that are consumed, um, and it contributes to about 45 million tons of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, and uh, represents uh, a municipal's operating cost of about 25 to 30%. Um, one of the key things to, to take away is that uh, given the magnitude of energy costs in a municipal portfolio of facilities and uh, the trend of energy costs rising, um, it's very important for municipals to, to be mindful that uh, this is going to be a growing part of their budget and as it's one of the largest parts of their budget. Um, it also represents one of the largest controllable costs uh, to the public which means that there are opportunities to become more energy efficient and add renewable energy so that uh, you're able to reduce that line item of the budget and pass those uh, savings through to your, to your citizens. Um, I'm not going to get too far in depth into the slide, but what I want you to take away from the slide is that there is a whole system behind treating wastewater and uh, um, uh, making this, uh, and this, that means there's a lot of opportunity for savings throughout this system and this supply chain. So when you look at this, there's uh, a few primary components. There's the treated source, there's the water treatment, there are end uses of water, which, you know, the faucets that in your own home or business, and then there's wastewater that goes uh, from those end uses to the collection and treatment and back to the treated wastewater. So within these different areas, uh, there are um, components of energy use, and where there's energy use, there is opportunity for efficiency. When you look at the treated source, there are opportunities to um, look at high efficiency pumping systems, motors, variable frequency drives, um, and there are opportunities to uh, create storage facilities so that uh, you're not having, so that you're able to reduce your cost around peak use time. Um, in the water treatment uh, area, there's opportunity to install data systems which can help you track uh, better your data around what's being used, when it's being used. And, and then correlate that with how much it's costing you to use. Um, there's also opportunities in treatment for high efficiency pumping systems, uh, as well as high, uh, installing high, efficient, high efficiency disinfectant equipment. Um, so with the distribution to the end uses, uh, there are significant opportunities to um, look at uh, the distribution system and looking at the pumping system, uh, and as well as the metering that's used to track how much uh, water is being consumed or how much water is being lost associated with those end uses. Um, there's also opportunities to work with the customers, uh, the citizens, the businesses, the residents to manage their water use through high efficiency 
uh, or low flow shower heads, uh, low flow toilets, and other water saving mechanisms so that there's less treatment uh, needed in the wastewater treatment sector. Um, when you get to the wastewater collection and treatment, there are significant opportunities around um, uh, the aeration equipment and anaerobic digestion. Uh, there's the possibility of implementing uh, cogeneration and uh, capturing waste heat and regener or generating electricity from it or generating biogases from it. Um, there's opportunities for um, high implementation of high efficiency motors, pumps, um, as well as uh, um, you know, making sure that the facility is right sized based on uh, the actual demand and the load needed to treat uh, the, the wastewater. Um, there's uh, more opportunities to track and collect data through the SCADA systems, and, um, and there's also opportunities to recycle water uh, when you get to the wastewater treatment area. So, um, and then you have the treated wastewater, which goes back through the system potentially. And again, there's opportunities for um, high efficiency pump, uh, pumping systems, motors, CFDs, uh, um, and, and the like. So, um, why these uh, opportunities exist in the wastewater treatment sector um, uh, and why they are of such magnitude? Uh, the equipment that's used uh, is, is really. Um, some of the, the most highly um, or high intensity, energy intensity equipment that, that is in a municipal system. Um, uh, you have also um, differing design codes that are needed based on where you are and um, what your municipal needs are. And so, uh, and as well as what the demands are on the wastewater treatment system and on the water system. And so, based on those design needs, uh, there are opportunities to. Um, uh, look at what your actual system needs and, and where those opportunities exist. Um, there's also uh, limited turndown capability. We all need to have the wastewater operations up and running. There's always wastewater, and so there's you know very little time where there's downtime, and so this equipment is running on a regular basis. Uh, and so there's opportunities as uh, you look at the operations of the equipment for uh, uh, running more efficient, efficiently and, and making um, upgrades uh, as you need. Um, you know, one of the more important things to consider is to focus on uh, um, all of the equipment that's on site. Um, a lot of times when you start implementing uh, energy efficiency or renewable energy systems, if you tweak one thing, it has an impact somewhere downstream on another part of the system. So looking at the system as a whole and is really important to consider um, so that you're, you're really making efficiencies throughout the system and not just on a, a, a equipment by equipment retrofit basis. Um, you know, other opportunities that come up is there are load changes and demand changes in the wastewater treatment sector. Uh, you may have, have a, a large commercial customer that is no longer um, contributing to your system uh, in the way that they once were. And so there may be new design opportunities to right size uh, the process of the system so that it is more applicable to your, your loads and the demands of your municipal. Um, Many of the wastewater treatment facilities that are in Minnesota today are only operating at 5% of the design position, which means there's a lot of room for implementation of efficiency uh, when you have uh, when you're only running at a, a small percentage of your capacity. And so there's an opportunity. You know, you may have a, a number of 100 power, 100 horsepower motors that are completely oversized for your system, and you could take a couple hundred horsepower motor off the system and uh, and right sizing to the load that you currently need or currently demand. So the value of energy efficiency, you know, you reduce your energy use. Uh, there are costs associated with consuming that energy, and when you reduce your energy, you reduce your costs. Uh, or at the very least, you mitigate the increase in energy prices that may be occurring uh, in your in your municipal area. Um, you also can improve your equipment and process operations uh, that uh, you can uh, by operating more efficient 
effectively and designing and designing your facility to only meet the, the demands of your system, um, you can create longer lasting um, uh, life in, of your equipment and if you are focusing on preventative maintenance and operations and maintenance of your system, uh, you can ensure that your system and your, your equipment is designing it at its best, that it's most efficient. Uh, and a lot of this comes down to cost. Uh, and so as you're able to reduce uh, your, your costs, uh, or as you're able to reduce your energy consumption and operate more efficiently, it does help you with the cost portion of your budget. And then there is the value of renewable energy. Uh, once you are able to get your system operating as efficiently as you possibly can to meet only the demand that you need to meet, um, it's a good time to start thinking about the renewable energy aspect. By focusing on efficiency first, uh, you're able then to reduce the cost of the size renewable system that you need for the overall operation. Um, combined heat and power is one of the focuses of uh, our, our grant uh, work in this area and as a renewable energy source. Um, some of the benefits that come with a, a well-designed combined heat and power system, which is the overall concept of CHP is that you take the waste heat and you turn it into a uh, renewable resource that you're generating yourself. Um, a lot of times, uh, in the particular the wastewater treatment sector, a CHP system produces power uh, or energy at a cost below the retail electricity. Um, it can dis displace purchase fuels for your thermal needs. Um, can potentially qualify uh, for renewable fuel sort uh, renewable energy credits under the or sorry uh, may qualify as a renewable fuel source under um, different renewable portfolio standards and utility green power programs. Um, there's uh, you know CHP is an excellent way to uh, increase reliability for your plant. Uh, it's a big deal if you're ever uh, in a scenario where your wastewater treatment operation may not have the energy supply that it needs. And so um, being able to generate your own uh, helps you be more self-sufficient and self-reliable um, and have a more resilient system for a very critical part of your municipal operation. Um, there is also um, uh, the ability to produce more useful energy um, uh, than if you were to use biogas solely to meet digester heat loads. Um, you can also potentially re reduce the uh, greenhouse gases and other, uh, other air pollutants primarily by displacing fuel uh, energy that you would get from your utility. And so um, uh, you can, you know, through this uh, implementation of renewable energy, you can do um, some part in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions uh, um, that are, are important to reduce. Uh, so a lot of this uh, logic and this understanding of where there's opportunity for and, and value and efficiency and renewable energy within the system led us to um, <coughs> grant funding from the U.S. Department of Energy. So why we chose this project? We wanted to have a, a high energy impact. We wanted to find you know, something that was really broadly applicable throughout the state. Uh, there's over 800 municipals in the state. Uh, a lot of them have the waste, wastewater and water utilities. And so we wanted to have a high energy impact in addressing uh, what our state needs. We also wanted to um, make sure it was relevant to the entire state so that we could bring federal dollars to the state and, and make sure that the entire state was, was getting the benefit of those dollars. Um, and something, um, you know, we have a, a long standing commitment in Minnesota to energy efficiency through uh, utility conservation improvement programs and renewable energy standards. We have a lot of statewide uh, energy policies and so we, we have a lot of frameworks and a lot of infrastructure built on uh, delivering efficiency to end users, to uh, businesses, to residents. And so we wanted to be able to leverage some of the strengths that we know we already have as a state. Um, we also know that it's incredibly complicated. When you start talking about these larger scale municipal projects, it's incredibly complicated and it requires a lot of partnerships and a lot of people to you know, get the, the financing and the funding in place 
to make these large retrofits, um, the engineering work that's required, um, and and you know getting buy-in from different administration levels within a municipal. And so we wanted to be able to take some of our strengths and engage as many of these partners. Uh, to try and create a path and a framework for delivering efficiency to this particular sector. And we wanted to set something up so that the savings could occur and a framework could be established for uh, delivering these types of energy efficiency savings and renewable projects beyond the term of the grant. We have three years of, of funding for this grant, but we want to, during this time, be able to build something that is sustainable in the long term. So project objectives, to motivate energy efficiency and wastewater treatment plants and to assess the opportunities for generation and um, uh, provide a plan for energy generation at select sites. Uh, this is where MNCAP, and they're going to go into more detail there, you know, the boots on the ground delivering this part of the project. Um, they're going to go into, Lori's going to go into more detail on the, the project objectives and so, um, as I mentioned, we have a lot of state uh, strengths. Uh, you know, our primary partners in this are the Pollution Control Agency and the University of Minnesota MNCAP. We're also working with the University of Illinois in Chicago on providing technical assistance on the uh, uh, power identification aspect of this project. Um, but there are other partners who are involved uh, um, and who should and who we are engaging at this time. Um, Department of Economic Development, knowing that you know there's a huge uh, financial component to this, uh, there's an argument to be made that by saving money in this sector, it frees up other dollars for different kinds of economic investment at the municipal level. We have other state administered programs like the Guaranteed Energy Savings Program, which provides performance helps uh, facilitate performance contracting for municipals. These are the, the projects that you can implement in a wastewater treatment plant uh, can help really um, buy down the cost of other efficiency measures that can be implemented throughout uh, your, your municipality. And so um, there's opportunities there. There's loan programs. There's grant programs. Utilities, electric and natural gas are required have save one and a half percent of their retail sales on an annual basis through energy efficiency and so they're offering uh, uh, funding um, through rebates or financial incentives to be more efficient. That includes municipal utilities and their wastewater treatment plants um, are, are eligible for those kinds of rebates and incentives. So. Um, technical assistance, uh, you know, there's also uh, trade associations, and so we're working to engage all of these different partners to make them aware and to start paving the way for a more uh, concerted effort uh, around this particular sector. Um, so as part of the implementation plan for this grant, uh, there's, there's four primary components. Uh, one is to develop partnerships for E2. Um, uh, we spent a, a good part of this last year in developing these partnerships with the Pollution Control Agency, with other municipals, with uh, rural wastewater and water associations. Um, so we've, we've identified the different sources available, and we want, and we've been creating partnerships. Um, conducting E2 assessments. That's where we are now. Um, we're actually implementing and delivering these assessments um, to wastewater treatment facilities through MNTAP's um, excellent engineering and technical assistance services. So um, uh, this is a, a really great time in this project. Uh, we're starting to be able to actually work with those uh, uh, actual operators of the wastewater treatment facilities and conduct those assessments and identify those opportunities for efficiency so that they can start looking at uh, the financing and the funding needed to make those investments in efficiency. Um, so we're facilitating site investments. Uh, with PTA is going to talk a little bit more about the site investments and, and where there may be funding available to uh, facilitate uh, implementation of these projects. And as we're doing this, um, uh, we're trying to scope out where are the prime sites for uh, assessing renewable energy opportunities. Uh, not every wastewater treatment facility has the same opportunity for 
uh, cogeneration or renewable energy, but there are some that are very prime and ready and could um, start implementing uh, in the very near future. So we're identifying those prime candidates so that we can help facilitate uh, some of those um, investments. Um, so some of our anticipated outcomes um, you know, there's a, a training component. We are training operators, and we hope to have at least 50 operators trained by the end of this grant cycle, and that we have conducted at least 10 energy efficiency assessments. Um, we hope to have identified uh, around 5 million kilowatt hours a year in uh, conservation opportunities. We're having regional discussions. Uh, we hope to have um, 10 regional discussions so that we make sure that we're capturing um, and, you know, the far corners of the state and uh, certainly not just the metro area. Um, and then having intern projects. Uh, MINTAP has uh, an excellent intern program where they're able to, you know, serve a couple of dual purposes, training new engineers so that they're aware of uh, efficiency opportunities when they become engineers out in the field, but as well as uh, making sure that they're using their skills to provide assistance in the water treatment facilities uh, um, under the mentorship of uh, some of uh, the, the full-time engineers with uh, MINTAP. Um, and then distributed generation. We want to have five distributed generation screening evaluations uh, and at least two detailed uh, um, PG assessments. And then have a couple of stakeholder discussions around what more is needed to facilitate uh, um, uh, DG implementation. Uh, the Department of Commerce also recently completed a grant um, looking at CHP opportunities uh, and held a number of stakeholder discussions and, and found that you know this sector is really a sector that we should be focusing on um, where the path is already you know through putting a few different pieces of the puzzle together that we can create a path forward and, and implementing uh, combined heat power in the sector. So for the project timeline, um, like I mentioned right at the beginning, uh, we're four quarters into this uh, and just starting on the fifth quarter. But right now, um, uh, you know, we like I said, we're conducting energy efficiency assessments through MINCAP's expertise um, and beginning to facilitate investment and identify other renewable um, opportunities. Um, so we still have a ways to go in the grant, but uh, it's um, uh, really important. So some of the next steps um, are to uh, have a follow-up session on implementation and financing uh, efficiency and renewable upgrades. And that will be on January 13, 2016. And I believe there is registration that is already available for this session that uh, if you want to, you can probably register right now as we speak. Uh, on um, for this for this uh, particular opportunity, there will be another follow-up session on February 16th um, on a wastewater treatment benchmarking. Uh, benchmarking is a, a, a huge component of uh, ongoing long-term management of your energy use. Uh, you can't manage what you don't measure, essentially. So uh, we'll be talking more about the importance of benchmarking and how to benchmark and what tools are available for free to you to use, as well as any potential state requirements for benchmarking that maybe uh, need to be addressed. Uh, um, we'll be uh, right now. We're identifying and engaging um, uh, efficiency and renewable energy candidate assessment sites. Um, so, if you think that this is something you're interested in, I would strongly encourage you, and you'll see some contact information throughout the presentations today. Um, uh, I would strongly encourage you to reach out to us so that, and especially MENTAP, so that you can get started on uh, um, uh, potentially getting an assessment. Um, we're looking at integrating Energy Star Portfolio Manager into the B3 benchmarking system. Um, many of you are familiar with uh, the B3 benchmarking system, and so we're looking at what are the needs of um, facilities so that we can make sure that this system can accommodate and be um, appropriate for wastewater treatment opportunities, uh, benchmarking um, system. We're engaging wastewater leaders in um, informational interviews so that we can learn. There's been a lot of great work already done in this sector, and so we're trying to leverage what's already been done and expertise that's already been in the field 
so that we don't have to um, reinvent the wheel and so that we're able to learn from the challenges that others have experienced uh, in, in this work. And then establishing, right now we're establishing training opportunities and curriculum. Um, this is another area where, you know, we hope to get feedback from those of you who are listening in today and may have experience. What is the curriculum that uh, is best suited toward wastewater treatment operators? So uh, I have been waved at and told that my time is done, which is great because this is my last slide. So this is the team um, of partners uh, here uh, working on this project. Uh, um, uh, you're welcome to contact any one of us on this list. Um, uh, so I'll leave this up here for a few minutes, and then I think these slides will be available through the recording as well as on. Um, through Green Step City. So uh, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Uh, and um, I appreciate very much your time. Uh, um, and I will take a few questions. Uh, yeah. So just to jump to, uh, back to B3, so I think Green Step Cities are familiar with uh, being able to benchmark a building mm -hmm. in B3. And there's now a, a new water tap. But can you say more about the Ability or the coming ability for a wastewater treatment plant to be benchmarked in? Yeah, so that's something we're right now scoping out with the developers of the B3 benchmarking tool. Um, we recognize that you know benchmarking wastewater treatment facilities is not the same as benchmarking a building. Uh, that the different metrics that you would benchmark are are um, uh, the the objectives that you would be looking at are different than looking at a kilowatt hour per square foot that you're looking. Um, so we're looking at, um, uh, you know, what is the, we're scoping out what data specifically needs to be collected and, and how should it be collected. How can we work with the existing Energy Star portfolio manager that does have a wastewater treatment um, uh, benchmarking. Um, and so uh, we're just kind of in the beginning of that and trying to figure out what the costs are going to be associated with that. So um, I don't know. Uh, right? Yeah, I'm getting a thumbs up. I answered it right. It's wonderful. <laughs> so hopefully here within the next few months we'll have a little bit more detail on, on uh, what's going to be available and a timeline around availability. So, so cities that get the, the B3 newsletter will be able to sort yeah, of absolutely. when they might be able to use a, a new tool. Which yep, okay. absolutely. Okay. Great. Fascinating presentation. Thank you. Um, you're dealing with a very complex, highly engineered system which everybody relies on. What are the timelines you're looking at for, from you know, a decision that yes, we're going to do this, to actually completing the capital investment and making the changes? Yeah, um, you know, we've learned a lot so far working on this grant around existing capital funding cycles, uh, bonding bill cycles, budgeting cycles, and it is right. It's very complex. It's not just the engineering system. Complex, the funding system is complex. Um, depending on the source of funding, uh, um, you know, and depending on how the wastewater treatment or municipal um, approaches it, um, you know, they may go through the Clean Water Fund, uh, they may go through the Guaranteed Energy Savings Program. It's going to differ the timeline, uh, um, and there are some that are more ready to embark on some of these capital investments than others. And so there's a prioritization that, that is occurring. Um, I think that I couldn't give you a specific timeline for any one of those paths. I think it's dependent on which path a, a municipal takes. Um, but we do recognize this is not something that, you know, in two months is going to be done from an assessment to implementation. That it could be, um, you know, several months to years before something is done. So I think it just depends on how ready uh, the municipal is in being able to invest in, in the magnitude of a project. I'm also getting a thumbs up there. Yeah, you may, uh, I'm on a maybe this will maybe uh, this will get covered later. But you talked about a variety of technologies uh, you know, drives motors to pump. Um, are there particular new technologies that haven't seen wide adoption in these facilities that could make a major difference, or is it a matter of? I mean, each, obviously each system is different, so you're going to have to design for it. But um, you know, are there specific kind of you know, silver bullets that could come and make a big difference? 
No, um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that there are uh, any necessary silver bullets that are are out there waiting in the wings. Um, I do think that there are newer technologies and aeration systems that um, could potentially help with uh, the the materials that are being passed through the system, as well as. Uh, the energy consumed or energy needs to to implement those types of aeration systems. Um, I think that it's really, you know, there was a slide I had earlier showing that, you know, operations are only operating at 30 to 35 percent of design. I think some of this really is in the design of the facility and, and the over design of facilities. And so making sure that uh, you know, the equipment that's being used is really right sized. And so I think, uh, you know, there, I, I wouldn't, I don't think it's necessarily about um, uh, new technologies at this point. I think it's about design and reconfiguration and ensuring that, uh, you know, we don't have more horsepower than we need at a very simple level. Right. <laughs> From a non engineer. <laughs> to a non engineer, so I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. So, any other questions? Do we have questions that come up on the go meeting? Not yet. I haven't been no. All right. Well, wonderful. Well, I truly appreciate the opportunity to participate in the Green Subsidies Workshop, and um, thank you for for your time and attention. And I'm going to turn it over to Adam to introduce the next speaker. Woo. Thank you. All right. So our next uh, presenter. Director of the Minnesota Technical Assistance Program at the University of Minnesota, where she is responsible for developing new outreach and assistance opportunities to meet the needs of businesses, water and energy efficiency, pursuing funding opportunities for program activities, collaborating with multiple in state and national partner organizations, and providing technical assistance to businesses in Minnesota. So Laura's presentation uh, will highlight MinTAP's past experience providing EE and RE technical assistance to Minnesota wastewater treatment plants and how sites can uh, participate in the assessment as part of this current grant. So I'll turn it over to Laura. Okay, thank you very much again for letting us speak to you this morning. Uh, uh, as was introduced, um, I'm the second speaker here talking about MINTAP. Um, I'm going to be talking a, a little bit about who MINTAP is for those who aren't necessarily familiar with us in our work. I'm going to be talking about some experiences that we had in a previous grant opportunity that really laid the foundation for the work that we're doing today and the, the project that we're talking about. And I'm hoping that during that you might be able to see yourself and your facility in uh, some of these uh, realities that we ran into. Uh, and then uh, what we hope to change in this current effort that's going to overcome some of those challenges that we ran into. Um, this half is celebrating 30 years of existence. We have been around for a long time in Minnesota. Our mission is to help businesses uh, with energy efficiency, water conservation, and primarily pollution prevention. So all of these things tend to roll back up to our environment. Uh, we are at the University of Minnesota on the Twin Cities campus. Uh, we provide technical assistance for the more efficient use of raw materials, water conservation, energy efficiency, and cost savings. Our work is confidential and non-regulatory, okay? So we are not on the regulatory side of this fence, um, and we work under confidentiality. Um, and any information that we share, we request permission to do that with our person. Um, MINTAP mission, again, strengthening Minnesota. Really, that's what we're all about, strengthening Minnesota businesses and municipalities by improving efficiency while saving money through energy, water, and waste prevention. Um, our services really revolve around one-on-one, -on -one, on site types of interactions. We're there for you. We're there for your facility. We do site assessments with our primary staff. Uh, and we have a very active and very dynamic uh, intern program that I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, talking to you about because that's an opportunity with this program uh, a little bit later. Uh, we also can come to a company and help them on a recurring basis uh, to strengthen their own internal energy efficiency or, or our, our sustainability team. 
Uh, we also operate the Minnesota Materials Exchange, which is a, kind of an online business-to-business -business Craigslist type of activity. And we do a lot of outreach and training activities. Um, our assistance to wastewater facilities, um, we've, got, we've been doing this for many years. We've been in uh, Minnesota facilities for a long time, mostly looking at upstream contamination. Uh, so really looking if a facility, if a wastewater facility is getting a large metal influx or high DOD or, or suspended solids, we can help that facility go upstream and identify the source of that, work with the companies that may be uh, having that issue in their facilities and help overcome uh, those, those issues. It helps the business uh, for their pollution uh, prevention opportunities and it helps the municipality meet their effluent requirements. Um, we, we recently got into the energy efficiency side of wastewater facilities with a grant from uh, EPA several years ago. And you can read a little bit more about MINTAP's assistance opportunities and uh, resources that we have for wastewater treatment facilities at this website. You can just search MINTAP wastewater and it'll get right there. Um, so the wastewater energy efficiency, this was a project 2011-2012, uh, where uh, funded by the US EPA. And the objective was to identify and implement energy efficiency practices for reducing consumption <laughs> and lowering costs overall. Okay, we went into this fairly naively, figuring, well, we know wastewater treatment place, uh, places, and, you know, they kind of trust us and, and, and know what we do. Um, our focus was on high energy use of uh, activities within the wastewater facilities, specifically activated sludge operations that use their pretty energy intensive, and the equipment for dissolved oxygen control. Well, what did we do? Uh, we were doing assessments. These were technology-driven assessments. So we were really staying on the technology side, dealing with uh, technology people, dealing with technology people in the facilities. We were looking at high areas of energy, uh, high, high energy use, and we identified um, benchmarking. So we were really measuring co uh, commonalities across facilities and differences. So we had uh, enough facilities within this, this survey to be able to benchmark. And that will be some of the discussion for the benchmarking presentations that will be held in February. So be sure to come back and listen to that because I'm not going to go into details here. Uh, we did a lot of training. We did some classroom training on energy efficiency opportunities. Uh, we did some demos, so we brought wastewater treatment operators together uh, and had them share the best practices that they were doing with each other. Uh, that worked out really well, and we also did some modeling of dissolved oxygen systems. Um, the technical assistance that we brought to this effort were MINTAP staff and the exact experience and the energy uh, conservation uh, opportunities that, that they all know about. We brought some consultants in to help us with these modeling efforts. And of course, our interns. We had uh, a lot of interns. We had a couple interns in facilities, and we realized the value of this particular tool. So the outputs for this particular project were 10 site assessments. It was very similar to what we're trying to do here. We had two intern projects. We had one training event, five technology demos. Those, were, those went very, very well and uh, the energy benchmarking study. All told, the opportunity for the recommendations that were made in this were over 5 million kilowatt hours of energy, um, totaling over $400,000 worth of savings opportunities for those businesses. These are the types of recommendations that were made. Um, so this, you know, someone asked earlier about what kinds of things we were looking at. These are the kinds of things that you see. A lot of DO control, that tends to be a very high energy opportunity um, and all of the associations, all of the equipment that goes along with that. So there's pumps and there's blowers and there's all kinds of equipment that goes along with that. UV pacing, uh, right sizing equipment, um, just measuring how it's being used and using it in an optimal way. So there's a lot of standard operating and best management practices that really work were applied, and it, then some of this has to be invested in, okay, you do maybe have to bring in the, the uh, control system, you maybe have to right size some of those pumps when you add DFTs uh, to control how your energy is using. So over, overall, we had 48 recommendations from those 10 site assessment systems, 48 recommendations for energy efficiency. Uh, not bad, not bad. This is the challenge. 
By the end of that grant, we had four that were implemented. Okay, I was very generous in saying 10% implementation. Actually, it's a little less than that. Uh, four implemented. Okay, we did it wrong. All right, we had great opportunity. We identified some great stuff. We were working on the technical side. Everybody was on board. Something was missing from this project. Okay, and that's why we're here today. What did we learn? Uh, we learned uh, there is a large opportunity here, folks. This is, this is a good place to look. Um, there are established priorities within these facilities, okay? We, can, we know what to look for. We, we can get into, into these facilities. Um, there are pretty much, you know, I, I, I would hesitate to say boilerplate, but there are pretty much things that you should look at when you walk in the door. Benchmarking is going to be new in this one. Benchmarking was very useful in that previous example. Uh, we're elevating the, the opportunity potential for that benchmarking so people can know where they are at all times. Training was well received. Um, so wrong. Um, and, uh, and then the demos were very effective. Um, modeling was very well received. <coughs> Uh, dissolved oxygen modeling and knowing the energy used in the in the uh, uh, oxidation stitches was very very uh, eye opening for very many people. The technical assistance mid task. Our role was to identify the opportunity. Consultants were there to develop new tools and to dig deeper into these and to help uh, the engineering firms and the companies to really get the opportunity potential nailed down for for the for the investment. And the interns were there to kind of scope the opportunity potential, go a little bit deeper in that um, they can spend uh, 500 hours with your facility and really dig deep, look at some experiments, look at some test equipment, look at some test operations. Um, this is a terrific opportunity to really scope out what might that opportunity look like and how could I get there. Um, the implementation is where we fell down, obviously, on the last one. Timing. So it's timing, timing, timing. Timing seems to be everything. Where was the facility in their investment cycle? Were they ready to be doing an investment? Did they have access to the capital needed to make these, some of these things happen? Um, even if it was a low cost uh, effort, sometimes the facility is in the mindset of we're going to make all of our changes at one time. And so, uh, you know, we're going to wait that five years until we're going to do everything all at once five years from now. And in the meantime, we missed some of that low-hanging fruit opportunity uh, that we might want to capture. Uh, and champions, uh, we, as I said at the beginning of this, we went on this from the cap, from the technical side. All right, there's a lot of people that need to be involved in these processes. There is, uh, you know, our, our city managers, there are the, the um, agency folks, there's the timeline for the state programming. There are a lot of partnerships. And so Jessica said it over and over again, partnership is going to be the key in this particular one to try and drive that implementation rate up higher than it was. I'm going to revisit this slide with that background about why did we choose some of these current milestone projects. Um, Engaging the wastewater facilities and the energy efficiency and distributed generation. That's what our primary thing is. That's why we're here today. That's why we're developing these partnerships. So you can hear it from multiple, multiple sources. You're going to hear it from your agency partners. You're going to hear it from your engineering partners. You're going to hear it from your university partners. Training. Uh, training was what we needed before, and we're going to do it again at, uh, at the Water co uh, Operators Conference in March. So look for this energy efficiency. This is self-help type of effort. We're going to have four-hour training during that session. Sign up now. Great. Uh, we're going to do ten of these assessments. We're in the, in the process of doing these right now. Uh, so sign up. Call us. We're there. We'll be there. Um, again, we're going to identify lots of uh, energy efficiency opportunity. We know that for a fact. This is the one, the intern project, that I really want to bring to your attention right now. For summer 2016, we are taking applications for MINTAP interns right now. I'm going to be showing you some of the wonderful things that an intern could do for your facility to hopefully inspire you and uh, have you want some, to do some of that. Um, 
going back, uh, uh, distributed generation is a big part of this. So not only are we looking at the energy efficiency, but we're forward looking in this project. We want to look at well, what is coming down the pipe next. And this distributed energy uh, is, is uh, specifically through combined heat and power. This slide came from the uh, USDOE Combined Heat and Power Technical Assistance Partnership. And it really, I'm not going to go into to combined heat and power, but essentially what it is, is it's getting uh, a little extra boost on your efficiency of the energy that you use. So essentially, if you use a fuel to generate some power uh, to, to operate your system, you can then take some of that waste heat and put that back through a secondary system to generate a little bit more power to get a little more work from that same spent energy. So that's, in a nutshell, all I know about combined heat and power. Um, as we go forward, I, I think it would probably be appropriate to have another conversation like this around combined heat and power, and we can hopefully get our partners engaged to do that. Um, so these are some of the site characteristics that you might be thinking about if you uh, might want to consider combined heat and power. Uh, you have perhaps access to nearby renewable fuels. Biogas is one of those types of renewable fuels. You have existing thermal loads. You have long hours of operation. So that's why wastewater facilities tend to fall into this, this uh, opportunity potential. As promised, I want to talk a little bit more about the NITAC intern program. We're very proud of this program. We get a lot of students that come through this program. We've had over 230 students in the 30 years that we've been running this, and uh, really it's a very strong program. So we're going to be focusing on solutions for pollution prevention and energy efficiency. That's what our interns do. They're hired and paid for by MINTAP through our grant funding. Okay. Um, you, you, as the recipient or as the host company, receive 500 hours of really great engineering help over the course of the summer. So this is extra eyes on your process that aren't really being taken away by operating day-to-day -day demands. Uh, they provide a detailed report uh, at the end of their project to direct future implementation, and we get to train the next generation of the engineers. Um, this is an example. This is the city of Hutchinson. Uh, they had an intern project uh, a couple years ago. Their target was to reduce their aeration energy consumption and, if possible, achieve higher uh, denitrification without capital investment. Uh, the recommendations were to consolidate to a single ditch operation. Um, the impact was a 43% decrease in their oxidation energy use. They saved almost 2,000 kilowatt hours of energy a day for almost $40,000 a year savings. This was an intern program. Uh, the intern did experiments, the intern uh, made suggestions, and the operators worked to make those happen, try them out, and make them real. Uh, the second one is the city of St. Cloud. This is an intern that happened a couple of years ago. Again, St. Cloud had made some investment in their facility. They didn't feel like they were getting all of the opportunity potential that, that they could have out of that investment. All right, so the investment had been made. What is the intern going to do? So the aeration blowers consumed about one-third of the facility's energy uh, electricity. The improved efficiency would reduce operating costs. The recommendation was to implement the most open valve control strategy and automate the valve positioning. Um, she worked very hard at this. Emily worked very hard at this. Uh, the opportunity was about almost a million kilowatt hours of energy opportunity uh, reduced, uh, $66,000, over $66,000 worth of savings. And third one, uh, lest you think this is all just very large facilities, the city of Rogers wanted to improve the energy efficiency of their oxidation ditch rotors. Um, David here, he uh, was able to recommend the installation of some new pond aerators and implement an aeration control scheme. Again, saving uh, almost 300 kilowatt hours per year, about uh, $18,000 uh, savings for that business. Now, these savings are one-year annualized savings. So as long as these programs are implemented, you keep saving that money year on year. So call about your assessment. This is your opportunity. 
Um, are you considering making capital improvements or expanding a redesign? Are you considering changes to reducing your total operating costs? Are you wanting to explore the use of biogas and what that could mean for your facility? Uh, are you willing to host an assessment at your site just to get an idea of what potential there might be? Are you looking for a summer intern to identify and implement some of this efficiency opportunity? Uh, intern applications are due by February 1. We're accepting them now. Don't wait. Uh, get them in there. Again, the people in the box are the MinPAC folks. Uh, this is the same slide Jessica has. This is our contact information. Just give us a call and let us know. Uh, we'll be out there and uh, we can get started on this process. Sure. Two things to say. This is Patrick Matthew from GPI. I like your examples because two of the three, um, Hutchinson and St. Cloud, we have someone on the webinar from those cities. Wonderful. That's great. And then, great, guys. And then kind of um, your comment earlier, are showing earlier on the project you had before where you just had the four projects that actually went through. Kind of a silver lining to that, I was in Rochester for an industrial energy efficiency workshop and um, some of the people there were from large manufacturers down there and they had worked with MinTAP and they loved your assistance, and they loved the interns that they had. And for them, though, like you said, with the timing, that was super key. And some of these, even though they couldn't do a majority of them right away, mm -hmm. the, the facilities manager said, we hold them, though. Yeah. A couple years down the line, five, ten years down the line, we dig those up. And when we have opportunities, we look back to see where we can pick up. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. They, they don't go bad. Yeah. <laughs> the recommendations don't go bad. Are there any other questions? that it is inefficient, what can you do to implement upgrades? 
how can you fund those upgrades? The rest of my presentation is about the possible paths to take in order to implement and finance these important energy efficient and renewable energy upgrades for wastewater treatment plants. So, show me the money. That's where it's always at. We have to fund these things. And that's why we've developed a variety of pots that you can pull from. The following resources I will uh, introduce fall into three different buckets. One is implementation and financing for wastewater infrastructure. This is wastewater treatment plants and drinking water plants exclusively. The next is implementation and financing for all public buildings, which could include those wastewater and drinking water facilities. And lastly, simply financing opportunities. The Guaranteed Energy Savings Program and the Local Energy Efficient Program can be used to implement and finance renewable energy and energy efficient projects in either one building or building citywide, while the project priority list exclusively funds only water infrastructure projects. Lastly, the Energy Savings Partnership and the Revita are only financing streams for projects that are ready to be implemented. I manage the Clean Water Revolving Fund, uh, and so I'll be able to answer questions regarding that resource. The managers for the commerce programs are in the audience, and they'll be able to answer specific questions to their program. We don't have time to go into each program in detail, so we wanted to make sure there was another opportunity, and there will be a more in-depth uh, session that will be held here at the League of Minnesota Cities on the afternoon of January 13, 2016. And it's already been mentioned, there is a web-based registration link that's available and will be sent to everyone that's registered for this project to help you uh, get in line for that uh, upcoming webinar. Uh, although the focus today is on wastewater treatment plants, it's important to think of drinking water uh, facilities as well. Uh, the uh, Public Facilities Authority and Department of Health run a parallel program to what I'll be describing with the State Revolving Fund, uh, but today we will just focus on the uh, wastewater facilities. So the Clean Water Project Priority List is managed by the Pollution Control Agency, and it sets the state single priority list for wastewater and stormwater projects. The primary source is going to be the state revolving fund. Uh, this is a low interest loan that utilizes an annual intended use plan that's put together by our partners, the Public Facilities Authority. And that provides low interest loans uh, to municipal projects for up to 30 year terms. In order to inspire uh, more energy efficient and green projects, uh, the federal government recently, about four years ago, established what's called the Green Project Reserve, which provides a 25% principal forgiveness for green projects, which include energy efficiency and renewable energy features. Now, principal forgiveness is just another way of saying grants. And you'll note, I started my presentation with the base program, which is the loan fund. Uh, everybody wants a grant, not a loan. But let's take a look a little bit at our loan program. Currently, we have almost $3 billion in revolving loan. We do anywhere between $125 million and $300 million in municipal wastewater and stormwater projects annually. This is a big deal. It's been there for approaching 30 years, and it'll be there into perpetuity. Cities have uh, grown used to this system, and we're trying to make sure that they take advantage of it for the energy efficiency and renewable opportunities. So a loan through the PFA funding, a million dollar project oftentimes works out to 800,000. So there's a 20% discount. But let's look at a million dollar project that has the green project reserve. And you qualify for that, the funds are available immediately. That million dollar loan is 750,000. You add that 20% discount. Now we're down to in the 20 or 30 year term, it would be about $600,000 to achieve a million dollars of improvement. We think that's a good deal. Uh, we hope uh, cities will take advantage of it. We have a supplemental fund called the Wastewater Infrastructure Fund that provides affordability grants to uh, high cost, high priority projects that are on the project priority list. Lastly, 
We have a point source implementation grant program that's brought to you by Clean Water Legacy Funds. Uh, that's a pollutant-based grant uh, that can provide 50% funding up to $3 million. Uh, it's important to note that other federal and state programs utilize the project priority list when they're making their award selections as well. Currently, the uh, Clean Water Project List has 300 projects for about $1.5 billion in need. The Project Priority List does have with it a separate technical review and approval process. But in short, PPL will be the best blend of grants and or loans for municipal wastewater projects. These are construction projects. And much like you'll hear commerce, PCA staff, and the uh, Public Facilities Authority Loan Officer is there to help guide cities through each step of the process and to point you in which programs best suit your needs. So make sure you take advantage of that. Uh, environmental or uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy components can be included in all projects and all programs. In fact, it's been eligible since day one. <coughs> Facility planning has always required a cost-effective analysis, which includes an energy analysis. But recent congressional and legislative action has only increased the importance of in, uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy in wastewater facilities. And so the PCA is currently working to uh, revise our guidelines to add additional rigor to make sure those program pro projects that are moving through the program have really given a serious consideration to how uh, E2 and RE could be beneficial. In short, these programs are boringly consistent, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> predictable, and we have yet to have anyone uh, not survive it. So we have 100% survival. <laughs> Moving to uh, Department of Commerce's the Guaranteed Energy Savings Program, or GASP, is a technical assistance program provided by Commerce to assist local units of government with the identification, development, financing, and implementation of energy efficiency and renewable measures. Local units of government access GEPS through a joint powers agreement with Commerce. GEPS contract documents have been vetted by the Attorney General's Office, the Department of Administration, and Department of Commerce. So the master contract requires open book pricing, utilizing maximum markups, and fees determined during the actual <coughs> selection. Subcontractors are pre-qualified, then invited to bid on the trade work and equipment. The savings measurement verification plan is reviewed by Commerce, must conform with GASP guidelines. GASP has 11 pre-qualified energy service companies, or ESCOs, as I mentioned previous, under a master contract with the Department of Commerce to provide energy savings performance contracting services to state agencies, local units, governments, and schools. A secondary competitive selection process is utilized to select the specific ESCO for your project from the 11 pre-screened. The selected ESCO uh, performs an investment grade audit to develop the project, providing a guaranteed maximum price and a guaranteed saving value. Prior to perform, performing these turnkey implementations of the selected energy efficient measures, that ESCO is selected, along with saving guarantee in terms of the project financing. Commerce reviews the annual measurement and ver verification report with ESCO, writing a check in the event of a shortfall. And Peter is the contact for that program. His information is at the bottom of the screen. LEAP, or Local Energy Efficiency Program, is designed to help local units of government, including wastewater treatment facilities, complete energy studies, or investment grade audits. Commerce helps to identify for the local unit government the best fit for LEAP among the other commerce programs. 
the local unit of government then goes into a joint powers agreement with the Department of Commerce and goes through the stages of LEAP shown in the process flow. LEAP will have a list of pre-qualified firms that provide technical energy services, including investment grade audits, to select for an individual project. LEAP provides a standard process documents, including site-specific RFPs, evaluation tools, work order contracts, and provides investment grade audit guidelines, all ensuring a comprehensive quality audit is achieved. If the local unit of government uh, implements a LEAP project, Commerce offers a supplemental cash flow agreement in the case of an annual energy savings shortfall. The key distinction between LEAP and GAP is that the local unit of government handles the engineering design work, construction bidding, and project implementation outside of the program using standard procurement practices. Any of the projects that have gone through LEAP are eligible for a lease purchase financing agreement through the St. Paul Port Authority. The Energy Savings Partnership is enabled by the same statutes as LEAP uh, and offers low interest rate lease purchasing financing. The local unit of government may finance a LEAP project outside of the Energy Savings Plan if they so choose. And Alex, from Commerce is uh, here to answer questions there, and Peter from the St. Paul Port Authority can be contacted as well. So the last program uh, I will cover uh, is the uh, Community Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Loan Program, or Rev It Up. This is a debt service collateral program. Eligible projects must demonstrate that project revenues will exceed debt service costs throughout the term of the loan. Now, revenue is defined through uh, verified savings. This would be utility cost savings, energy savings, operational savings through labor or preventative maintenance costs, energy production of renewable energy, the value of the actual renewable energy produced, or from the revenue generated from increased productivity, typically related to commercial businesses and projects that increase manufacturing capacity. Other forms of security include equipment value or collateral, capital contributions or credit enhancements, a written commitment of capital by the borrower in the event of a non-payment. However, unlike general obligation bonds, <coughs> Revenue bonds are not issued based upon the full faith and credit of the borrower. There's a solicitation process that has just started with this new program. In 2015, Commerce issued the first RFP. Awards have not been released, but they're expected to be shortly. 2016, Commerce anticipates issuing a second RFP at some point in 2016 with awards that will follow thereafter. So that process is RFP solicitation, evaluation and award, and project underwriting, bond insurance, loan agreement authorization, debt service and repayment can be up to 20 years. So Eric is the contact for that program and his information is located at the bottom of the screen. So that is a an entire uh, listing of all of the programs, but the ones that we wanted to focus, focus on that we feel fit best with the audience we have today. So with that, I'd stand for any questions. Go. So jump back, so the, the Green Project Reserve uh, fund, you were saying the PCA is considering adding must I forget the phrase you use, but what the, <laughs> tell us more. Not quite. Uh, when Congress reauthorized the Clean Water Revolving Fund uh, almost two years ago, first time in almost 25 years, uh, they required additional uh, scrutiny regarding energy efficiency and renewable energy. 
to cost and effectiveness. And so the agency is currently working with the Association of Consulting Engineers in order to develop what would be a more intensive, uh, more standardized review of energy opportunities and the projects that are seeking funding through the project priority list. The Green Project Reserve is a is, uh, was uh, developed and created through the Obama administration. It's a year-to-year -year authorization. It is still in effect, uh, and those guidelines have remained the same as when it was implemented in 2009. Are there any questions from our listening audience? So with that, thank you all very much. Before Adam introduces the last speaker, um, I just want to let the audience know about um, where resources will live and what timeline is receiving those. Um, there'll be a web page where the webinar recording, all the PowerPoints, um, and then any other resources on um, how you apply to the MinTAF initiative, the, um, the deadline, the website, the deadline for the MinTAF engineers, and all the other resources and offerings today will be on one web page and um, for sure by the end of the week by Friday um, I'll, also send, I'll send a follow-up email with that link um, and then also at that time if you're interested and we haven't um, corresponded to any of the contacts that have been in the presentation today um, I'll give you an opportunity to respond to me and I'll forward your um, emails on to the Department of Commerce and TAP um, the appropriate people to get you signed up also, for in the room, any city staff will pass around physical evals, and on the back you can write your intent of what you're interested in joining, um, and then your email. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so our last, last but not least, is uh, AJ, who is an engineer with Mintap and provides technical assistance in the areas of industrial energies and conservation. Uh, this project includes uh, researching energy efficiency opportunities for a variety of industries, including wastewater, manufacturing, hospitality, healthcare, and state centers. So AJ's presentation will provide an overview of different energy efficiency operator trainings that are going to be available for this project and uh, how and why facilities should participate in the energy efficiency assessment. So with that, AJ. Okay, thanks. Um, so, again, my name is AJ, and I'm just here to talk about uh, how we're going to get involved and go over a couple of uh, important training stuff. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about two trainings that are coming up in March um, that hopefully you can direct your operators to. Um, <coughs> Conferences. Go so over again the benefits of participating in assessments. So some of it's going to be repeat, but I thought I'd just bring everything back home, kind of as a reminder of why it's important. Um, what you're looking for in your city and your plant operations to help you decide if you should participate, and then how to get started. So uh, importantly, kind of with the last agenda item here, without a bullet, is something for you to do. Uh, this these set of slides here talk about content that is going to be most relevant to your operators in your city for the wastewater treatment plant. So. Um, go ahead and share them with us because it has important information for the trainings that they can attend and for information and resources really it should create that the owners. Uh, so first of all, uh, on March 1st, um, from 1 to 1.50, as part of the 32nd Annual Minnesota Rural Water Association Water and Wastewater Technical Conference um, in St. Cloud, we're uh, hosting this a short uh, session for operators that's going to be pretty similar to what you're viewing today. So it's going to be talking about um, they're giving a project overview, kind of telling who the project partners are, what roles we'll play, um, give example opportunities um, and successes that our group has had in wastewater treatment, energy efficiency, and, and uh, investments before, and then a full review of the financial assistance mechanisms that we've identified as part of this project. So this is a, a good opportunity. I know that, that this session is recorded and certainly the operators can uh, view this, but this session at the Minnesota Rural, Rural Water Association, this is their technical conference, uh, and this is one of two major conferences that 
uh, likely your operators are already going to attend uh, if they're engaged with uh, the community and the other operators in other cities. Um, so this is the first one, uh, March 1st from 1 to 1.50 in St. Cloud. And so more information and you can register right now at this website that's displayed here. Uh, secondly, this is, a, this is the larger four-hour training that we were talking about. Um, this is going to be at, at uh, the 79th Annual Wastewater Operators Conference run by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. So this is later in March. Uh, this specific session is March 24th from 1230 to 4.30. It's going to be focused on energy efficiency and small and medium wastewater treatment. So this is going to be a much more technical training covering the, the aspect of opportunities in greater detail. So um, this is a larger uh, list of topics that will be covered at this training. Um, electric costs, we know that a lot of operators don't even see the electricity bills and the energy bills that come into uh, that are that are run up by the which larger costs of read the bills and understand that information. Um, we're going to benchmarks, benefits of plant benchmarks, efficiency duty zones, and process considerations. So different tweaks that they can make to how they're operating that might not require capital. Uh, further pumping system evaluation is how to identify efficient and non efficient pumping and then low capital opportunities. Uh, of course we talk a lot about aeration systems, this tends to be the highest single energy use within our plant which has got an activated flow process. Um, and then lower opportunities for the few there. Lastly, uh, VO control is another opportunity that comes with a lot. That's going to be talking about why VO control, what what range is uh, useful, which with what range is uh, just wasteful in terms of how much oxygen you're putting into your system. Evaluating incentives that utilities might have, covering and how to prioritize projects that the, that may come up for the plant, and then how to uh, measure and verify that you're actually getting the energy that any opportunity that um, Just a little bit uh, on the instructor. This uh, Tom Jenkins, I met him uh, in August. There was a training that was held in Sheboygan, East Dota, for Wisconsin. So he's a, a consultant and a professor at W Madison. And he's got over 30 years' experience with wastewater treatment plants and designing systems, uh, analysis and control systems, generation controllers. And so he's been uh, I, I attended one of his trainings that was held in Wisconsin, like I said, and it had really great content. We think it's going to be a really great opportunity for operators to hear this information firsthand. Um, of the opportunities that may exist for So, uh, registration will soon be available at the PCA website here. Um, so, and with both of these sessions, both the Minnesota Rural, Rural Water Association and the PCA meetings in March. They tend to have uh, many sessions. So these are just two sessions that are at uh, these events, but we, of course, are highly recommending them for, for your operators to attend. So um, get them this information on how to uh, register and attend, and then uh, hopefully they can see them there at the training center the session. Okay, so uh, just going over the benefits of participating in our project. Uh, so every city that we work with, Generate an energy star portfolio manager store. This is a benchmarking tool that hopefully you're aware of, aware of if you're not already using the B3 benchmarking, which will soon uh, have uh, like our, the ability to accommodate wastewater. Uh, the energy star portfolio manager system right now has the capability to provide a score for plants above a certain size, so greater than uh, 600, 600, yeah, 600,000 gallons per day. Um, it does take some effort to use the Energy Star Portfolio Manager system to enter in your information. Um, we've got kind of the, the algorithm and calculation that is used in their analysis. So with utility information and with some pretty basic uh, plant information that's already logged and maintained by your operators, we can kind of calculate a quick estimate of what your score may be without uh, any entry. So it's a really quick way and we can offer this to we actually use it as one of the means for kind of screening cities to identify whether it's a good uh, facility for an assessment or a possible assessment. So my, my next topic is the 10 assessments that we're providing. Uh, so if we get an idea and we're talking with your operators and uh, about the plant and how it's operated, we can get a pretty good idea of whether there's a potential for uh, energy savings and opportunities for your city or your plant. And then we will 
spend the day, uh, no more, hopefully no more than a day, unless you have to make some measurements and come back and pick up equipment later. Um, we'll uh, come out to your city, uh, come to your waste water treatment plant, and collect uh, information, and then run the analysis and provide you with those results. Um, MINSAP interns were mentioned before. We're hoping to fill three projects through uh, 2017. Um, so how are these different than the energy assessments themselves? Um, largely it's about time and it's about the level of uh, the understanding and work that you need to go into an opportunity to fill. An intern would be a really great fit for a city or plant that has a, a larger opportunity that is more nuanced. It would need more time to um, do tests or run analyses on uh, proposals and changes that are made to try to affect that. <laughs> So, two ways that we use interns uh, to identify and assess new opportunities um, or to help implement existing opportunities. So, there may be additional work um, once we provide an initial screen and estimate of what the saving potential might be. An intern could then carry that forward uh, to work to implement, uh, helping with the utilities if they exist, um, and realize just uh, kind of some of the new concepts of working these sorts of implementations. Okay, and uh, biogas utilization evaluations were mentioned. Uh, these are provided by the Midwest Finding Power Technical Assistance Partnership. Um, and they will help you determine if you have finding power is viable opportunity at the plant. Um, so uh, we're talking about uh, anaerobic digesters that are creating biogas. Um, there are some cities that have uh, even started looking into accepting high strength waste from uh, food industries. So drier oil that they can put into their wastewater treatment plant to also help generate even more gas than the other is coming in. Um, so that's a, one opportunity um, that's separate from the assessment, but uh, it's an add-on if you have a plant that is uh, interested in generating your own power and lightening the amount of electricity you're using in the energy environment. And then finally, uh, participating with us will help you connect to uh, the state and federal financial system resource each uh, we've identified. Uh, so should you participate in assessments? Um, so this is uh, in regards to those 10 assessments that are provided by VINTAP. Uh, if your facility is expanding, redesigning, uh, making capital improvements, or considering uh, doing that within the next uh, few years, definitely a good opportunity for you to participate in our assessments. Um, of course, it helps if you're willing to consider uh, cost effective changes um, or changes to operation at your plant. And for the biogas utilization evaluation, uh, if you are considering or already using anaerobic digestion, uh, which generates biogas, uh, this is a, a certainly a good indicator that you may have a benefit from getting a, a biogas utilization evaluation or if you're just curious of whether this is an option. So you may have uh, aerobic digesters already. Um, those can be and often are converted to anaerobic digesters to get that added benefit of creating biogas. Uh, so these evaluations, um, consider your waste loading, consider your hydraulic flow, uh, and determine whether and what, uh, what payback a combined heat and power installation might have at your facility. Okay, so I guess the term for commi commitment for participation was used earlier. Um, I'm trying to indicate and, and show you that there's really not a whole lot of commitment involved with this. So, um, what we do is we try to target energy intensive processes that we know are energy intensive at plants. Uh, so, we're going to be identifying uh, those areas that we have, have seen uh, improvements done in the past at other plants from previous case studies, um, those that tend to affect the high energy use intensive processes. And we want to hear what, uh, outside of our own expertise and knowledge, we want to hear what operators have for ideas too. So they may have 5, 10, 15 years or more experience operating their plant and have a lot of observational information, anecdotal information that can help lead our analysis and help identify new areas that we might not have existed before. Um, we try to make things easier in terms of uh, working with the utilities to obtain uh, energy utility data which uh, helps us quite uh, greatly in our projects, uh, both determine the scope and the impact of certain opportunities. Uh, 
Uh, and like I said, a lot of times the, the utility bills don't make it to the operator, so trying to track those down within the city can be a challenge. And so we have uh, utility release forms where we can attempt to get that data uh, with the approval of the city, and so uh, the operator doesn't have to hunt it down. We also try to involve design engineers um, that are contracted by your city to help design and redesign the facilities over time. Um, we get a good amount of information from those engineers in terms of how the plant was originally conceived and, and conceived to operate. And so they can help uh, provide information on the plant that uh, might have gotten lost after years of, of operation since the design. And uh, another thing that helps make this process easy is that for modeling the aeration uh, energy use, which tends to be the highest uh, draw, we are able to use those facility loading, hydraulic loading, and uh, organics loading information that's already being collected by the wastewater operators as part of those permit requirements. So DMRs is what's shown here. That's the discharge monitor and report, and the operators are well aware of them and familiar with them. So this is information that they're already collecting to prove to PCA and EPA that they're meeting their permit requirements um, on the environmental side. Because the energy use greatly correlates with the amount of plant loading and, and treatment that needs to be done at each plant, this information is, is extremely valuable and goes into our analysis and luckily they're already collecting that information. So really uh, participation we're trying to make easy. Uh, I talked about commitment. The only commitment we really have is, is your time. Like, there's no added cost for this assessment uh, for the biogas evaluations as well. Uh, just interest and time. How many municipal wastewater plants use portfolio manager? Is it like five percent or fifty percent or ninety? I mean, it's fifty percent. We might have a better idea of the of the plants and cities that are using the PC benchmarking. Carl, you had two or three that are using manager on the Energy Star website. Okay, so two or three maybe in the in the in the states that are using that. Wow. I think it has a lot to do with the, like I mentioned, the operators might not have that information yeah. uh, at their disposal to enter in the utility information that uh, would match with their plant benchmarking information. So um, it's not a tool that's, you know, they don't have a huge marketing uh, capabilities at Energy Star and, and the Department of Energy to market that tool. So uh, if cities are aware of B3, they might have heard of uh, uh, the Interstate Portability Manager as well. Um, but yeah, it's not not widely used. We're hoping by running that quicker analysis to kind of show them where they are that this could be a valid tool for this program. Yeah, and I guess that's that's about it. Um, it's just uh, how to get started is mostly just by contacting us. So uh, I put my name and the phone number and email along with uh, all the all these uh, the other engineer in the room. We're the primary leads on the assessments for this grant project. So, are there any other questions at this time? All right. Okay. Great. Well, I think that's, that's it. So thanks for your time.
Okay, I'm so new at this. You're going to have to forgive me. So just for a simple sort of one-liner, a city that would be interested in um, in talking to Mintep about an assessment should contact Mintep. Yeah. 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 Got it. Yeah. That's a straight. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, for yep, any facilities that are interested in a EE or RE assessment, uh, contact AJ or uh, Laura or or Carl. Um, there's a there's a piece on the assessment. So once you reach 10 <clears throat> uh, facilities that want to go through the assessment, then, you, then you're maxed out in terms of capacity to... Hopefully not. Hopefully but not. <laughs> Could be more than 10? Yeah, I mean, yeah. We, we, have, we have funding for the program through uh, the end of 2017. So, you know, if we have 50, that could be a problem. But I, I certainly say we wouldn't want to say, oh, 10, you're 11, too bad. Um, okay. We'd want to really, you know, kind of be flexible. Laura, well, on the three interim projects you talked about, um, you know, Jessica talked about the challenges with the financing and capital investment structures. Um, now, you said you only got four or 48, but, you know, in direct marketing, that would be really good. And it looks <laughs> like in terms of the results you got, you had really good results. Right. Um, what were some of the key things that allowed those three cities to move forward? Did you just hit them at the right time, or...? I think part of it is that I, I don't want to imply that that's all that came out of that project. Those those opportunities are still with those cities. Mm -hmm. They are they are still in their portfolio of opportunity, and they are still being revisited. Um, we've talked to facilities. You know, we we do a lot of follow up with facilities, and that um, that is actually something that they don't go away. So that was a little misleading. It was. It was more for effect than, um, than, than reality, but, um, you know, so a few more get implemented every year, a few more get every year. They get rolled into some of the larger projects that we talked, that uh, Bill talked about, so um, that's it. But yes, timing, I think, is really a key here, is when is it appropriate to start this process, or when is it most critically effective? Um, pretty much uh, any time, you know, if you're, if you're Thinking of rolling this into a larger programmatic, uh, you know, type of a PPL type of program, maybe it's the, the the optimal time as we're learning is maybe before that process starts, like the year before you're thinking you want to be on board that that process. That gives you time to get this fully assessed, gives your engineers time to kind of scope it out and bring it into the project. So if you were picking up an absolute perfect time, I'd say the year before you want to get on the PPL list. Um, beyond that, I mean, there's, there are projects of, of all sizes, right? Okay, so we've got really large ones that require massive capital. We've got operating opportunities that really require no or minimal capital. So, you know, can those happen at any time? Really, that's the mindset of the facility themselves and, and how ready the community is to bring those in. Uh, there's self there's self funded activities that may be opportunities for very very small capital types of projects that have really good payback and then there's of course all the other uh, financing opportunities that were brought to bear today that really have different timelines as well so um, if you're you're thinking about the traditional process I mean if you want the absolute sweet spot maybe the year before the PPL target date. Uh, but certainly we can we can operate any other time as well. Um, and the interns again, there you know if you have an operational change that you want to make, that's a, that's a great way to get some experimentation done. Uh, any other questions for uh, any of our presenters? Uh, I, I did have one for. Uh,
So the question is related to my reference to how the PFA funding, which is an actually underwriting of the city's original financing of the project, and it's a reimbursement program. Generally, rule of thumb is PFA's interest rate results in about a 20% discount over what the city would receive. Because the SRF interest rate is just that much stronger than a lot of cities, not all, and in a, in a market uh, interest rate market now where it's been held down over the past several years, our money isn't quite as attractive in a higher interest rate environment. But still, there are savings that may be of advantage to cities. There are additional steps administratively that you have to go through, so you have to weigh out that to see whether it's really worth it. Okay. But generally, if you've got a project that exceeds 300,000, uh, certainly a million, you want to be looking at our program because uh, it does have advantages that your financing on a, on a local level can't match. Actually, maybe related. So, <clears throat> any sense of across Minnesota, do 10% of cities not go through PFA? Pete, the question. 25? So, the question is uh, how many cities uh, actually take advantage of this opportunity? Uh, I believe that we've entered in, uh, PFA has entered in agreements with uh, maybe 400 cities over the 30 years of existence. Um, that's a pretty good number. Uh, got a lot of repeat customers, uh, but not everybody takes advantage of it. And a lot of it has to do with size, scope, timing, and uh, local existing uh, uh, funds that, that are available or interest rates. Lindsay. So if I were a city and I uh, scoped a project for my, my wastewater treatment plant that has reasonable energy and efficiency scope, how do I utilize the green stuff reserve? Okay, so I just want to point out I'm not reading from script here. And Lindsay has asked, if you do have a project that would have these components, how do you actually get it into the process? And uh, you know, ideally it comes in in the beginning of the facility planning process, uh, so that when you start to select your alternative, it's part of that uh, project proposal. But really, uh, these projects that are funded through the priority list are the city's projects. It's their project, it's their schedule. Should they choose to build it in later on, we'll do what we can to make it happen. It just smooths uh, the process if it's earlier rather than later. Uh, and essentially, uh, any renewable energy project will categorically be eligible for uh, principal forgiveness. And energy efficiency projects generally need a 20% energy uh, savings from the original component to the replaced component. And so those are the parameters that we're working from currently. Um, there are other options, so uh, if you don't quite meet the 20% standard, uh, work with your MPCA review engineer to see uh, what alternatives could exist. So, uh, any, any other questions? Uh, questions from the uh, online audience? Uh, Well, if, uh, if you have any questions that, that come to your mind after the webinar, feel free to uh, follow up with any of our project team here. We're, we're happy to answer any questions that uh, interest in the project. And uh, I know we'll be following up with uh, resources after this uh, after the workshop. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diane.